Have you ever wondered why I say, in my own totally subjective opinion all the time? Well, this week's conceptual thought idea of the week is, does reality actually exist? And if so, how should we be talking about it? And once we've figured out that whole reality thing, we'll examine David Cronenberg's existence from 1999 in this week's Analytical Filmmaking Analysis of the Week. Understanding is useful, so here we go. I'm Carl King, and this is The Carl King Show, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and creativity. If you like this show, head over to patreon.com slash carlking and join for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennia Media. Now, let's get this episode beginned. Just a few Carl King the Human updates, and then we will officially get beginned. First, an update on Dale Lewis needs a mobility scooter. I want to say thank you to everyone who has donated. The GoFundMe is succeeding. Our goal is $2,000, and we have so far received $1,280. And in the meantime, someone has donated a used motorized wheelchair, which is lower capability in terms of weight and battery range. So we hope to order the higher capability scooter and deliver it to Dale soon. If you can throw a few bucks into that GoFundMe, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And second, speaking of things with wheels, I put air in my bicycle's tires and started riding again this week. I call my bike the Ramsey One because it's a decade-long tradition that I ride it while listening to The Dave Ramsey Show. Nearby, there's a quiet community with a lake, and little streams, and ducks, and turtles. So I like to pedal around over there. I make a brief stop on the bench to appreciate the scenery, take a drink of water, and then I head back home. It's about eight miles round trip. So that's some good news in the department of Carl King's health. And remember, everybody, get out there and get some exercise. And now, let's move on to this week's conceptual thought idea of the week. Have you ever wondered why I say in my own totally subjective opinion all the time? Well, this week's conceptual thought idea of the week is, does reality actually exist? And if so, how should we be talking about it? We're going to explore the topic of reality, both objective and subjective. In other words, the concrete reality that is external to us versus our own internal personal experiences of that reality. But first, who cares? (laughs) Why does this matter to me? Well, in trying to understand how films work, I want to go deeper than this film was good and this film is bad. That's most of what you find out there in movie reviews. As someone who writes their own films, third-party opinions have no value to me because I'm here to learn. And to do that, I need to focus more accurately on the elements of filmmaking, separating taste from technique and objective measurement rather than subjective commentary. So that's why this week we are contractually obligated to back up and first think about objective and subjective realities. Now, I subscribe to the belief that there is an external objective reality, but we can't quite experience it directly or accurately. And here are two metaphors that can help explain that. 
The first is Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And the story goes like this. Some people are chained up inside a cave and can't see what's happening outside. They can only see shadows cast on the wall by things outside of the cave. And they have to figure out what is happening based only on the shadows. And that's not easy to do. The second is the metaphor of some blindfolded people trying to describe an elephant. And one blindfolded person might be touching the elephant's trunk, believing that an elephant is long and flexible and soft. And another might be touching the skin on the elephant's side, believing an elephant is rough and solid and heavy. So they aren't aware of the other parts of its body or that there is actually an entire elephant. The meaning of these ideas is that we don't have direct access to reality. It's too big and outside the bounds of our senses. And all of the sensory information is also filtered by our brain. So our brain only alerts us to what aspects of reality it thinks are relevant to our survival from moment to moment. And since we can only see shadows or touch one part of the elephant, we will each experience a different subjective reality. In general, we all experience a close enough approximation of reality, but when we don't, we have problems. In my teenage years, I got sucked into Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, which basically says reality is objective and we should simply act in accordance with it. Well, that sounds easy enough, and it might sound like common sense, and it's actually our default way of operating because we want to believe our eyes. I can see the grass is green, and I can see there's a truck coming towards me. So in that way, Ayn Rand's objectivism is kind of the most obvious philosophy a human could invent. But it has several flaws, and one is the assumption that our perceptions of the world the information our senses detect about objective reality, are accurate, and they are not. Let's talk a little bit about this TED video called Your Brain Hallucinates Your Conscious Reality by Anil Seth. He's professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and he says the brain is a prediction engine. Perception has to be a process of informed guesswork in which the brain combines these sensory signals with its prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is to form its best guess of what caused those signals. The brain doesn't hear sound or light. What we perceive is its best guess of what's out there in the world. He then demonstrates various perceptual illusions, surprising the audience, and he continues... Instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain from the outside world, it depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. We're all hallucinating all the time, including right now. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, we call that reality. And there's another TED video from Donald Hoffman, cognitive sciences professor at the University of California, Irvine, called Do We See Reality As It Is? And he says, we think of our vision as like a camera. It just takes a picture of objective reality as it is. Now, there is a part of vision that's like a camera. The eye has a lens that focuses an image on the back of the eye where there are 130 million photoreceptors, so the eye is like a 130 megapixel camera. But that doesn't explain the billions of neurons and trillions of synapses that are engaged in vision. What are these neurons up to? Well, neuroscientists tell us that they are creating in real time, all the shapes, objects, colors, and motions that we see. It feels like we're taking a snapshot of this room the way it is, but in fact, we're constructing everything that we see. And the third witness I call to the stand is Steve Vai, 
And for those of you with Carl King bingo cards, you can mark that one down. And while Steve Vai isn't exactly a scientist, he has a video called And We Are One, in which he addresses what he calls the most important question, how do you feel? At 39 minutes, three seconds, he says this, what you perceive in the outside world is a reflection of how you feel, no exceptions. So he's making the argument that our emotional state influences our perceptions. Here's an example. Have you ever read a text message or email that you thought was rude or offensive and then reread it later and discovered the words and meanings changed before your eyes? I've realized that when this happens, it's likely I was already in a bad mood when I read the message, which then affected my interpretation of the message. By the way, there's a funny Key and Peel sketch about texting gone wrong, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, even when we're in a great mood, our minds are plagued by logical fallacies and cognitive biases. And it doesn't matter how objective we try to be or how many Ayn Rand books we read, our brain will still do those things constantly. And it's just like looking at an optical illusion in that we can't not see it even if we know how the illusion works. So even though we know through science that we're all living in our own subjective realities, we still operate and treat each other as if we are sharing a single unfiltered objective reality. So here are my suggestions for dealing with that. Number one, be careful of the word is. D. David Borland Jr. invented a form of the English language called E prime designed to eliminate the words is and are along with other forms of to be. And here are a few examples. The cat is lost becomes I can't find the cat. The movie was good becomes I enjoyed the movie. Steve Vai is the best guitarist becomes of all the guitarists, I enjoy Steve Vai the most. So we're basically transforming objective statements into subjective statements, and that helps you distinguish fact from opinion. And this E prime structure gives the actor in the sentence clear ownership of the action. Not that anyone cares. And there are arguments against E prime, but I find it to be a helpful tool. Number two, we can use more hedging in our statements. For instance, it seems like, or I suspect, or my personal favorite, in my own totally subjective opinion. You can even throw in a maybe. And this can cause the problem of inflating our language. And Grammarly will tell you it sounds less confident, but in the end, it's more intellectually honest. Number three, we should have some reasonable amount of humility and expect to be wrong often. If you don't feel like you were wrong about something today already, I recommend going back and looking at your day more closely. And if you've got other suggestions on navigating objective and subjective realities, go ahead and share them as a comment. And now that we know all about reality, let's move on to this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is Existence, written and directed by David Cronenberg. Existence was released on April 19th, 1999, and spoiler alert, it's a film about nested virtual reality. There are people inside a video game playing a video game, but it turns out that even that was all inside of another video game. So it's video games all the way down. Coincidentally, Existence came out only about two and a half weeks after The Matrix. The film starts with three and a half minutes of abstract type two opening titles. And then we get the extreme opposite, an opening scene containing heavy type one exposition. A guy is up on a stage introducing a new game called Existence. And here's a narrative device, Cronenberg uses the audience in the film as the proxy 
for the audience watching the film. And that's an efficient method of delivering information to the viewer. The guy tells us who the main characters are, what the film is about, and how existence works. And to drill that information into our heads, not only is the word existence printed on promotional banners, the guy writes it on a chalkboard, and he even tells us how to spell it, which letters are capitalized. But there's no reason he would need to do that for an actual audience. And that's the first implausibility. In the commentary track, David Cronenberg called this opening scene anti-cinematic, which I think is a valuable concept. And I wonder if he meant anti-cinematic as having a different meaning from non-cinematic, sort of like Nassim Nicholas Taleb's term anti-fragile. Jude Law also serves as a stand-in for the viewer. We go through the entire existence initiation process with him as he is introduced to the game. He's a total outsider to this world because he doesn't have a bioport. And that's convenient because much of the film is Jennifer Jason Lee explaining things to him. So it's a lot of factual statements rather than humans relating to each other. And that's very type one. After that first scene, alarms went off in my mind and I began to wonder what the heck is happening here with the acting and writing? Why does this film feel so low budget like a porno? Well, I think it's a combination of two elements. Number one, a physical acting behaviors style, and two, on the nose dialogue. So regarding the first element, when I say physical acting behaviors, I mean, it's a type of acting that is external. It isn't rooted in genuine human behavior and doesn't flow out of action and reaction with the other actors in the scene, rather than the actor embodying and believing their character. It's more like doing acting things or acting like an actor instead of being a human. I'm tempted to call that type one acting. It's the sort of thing you would see in 80s TV shows like say these words and look like you're mad. Now I'm not familiar enough with Jennifer Jason Lee's filmography and what else might have contributed to this, but making a film is hard and I don't know what was going on that day. There could have been any number of technical issues. Maybe there were better takes, but the shots were out of focus. Everything that is not the acting can conspire to affect the acting. We don't know. But we do know that she's an accomplished professional with decades of experience, and she's even a nominee for multiple Golden Globes. But still, her performance in several scenes didn't seem to be based on organic causality. Her facial expressions and reactions appeared conspicuous and abrupt and disconnected. And regarding the second element, the on-the-nose type 1 dialogue, that's when characters make literal descriptive statements that don't need to be said. Type 1 movies and TV shows are full of talking that could be saved for audio description tracks. Since film is first and foremost a visual medium, we don't need the characters telling us what we already see on the screen. I suspect that this dialogue style was carried over from theater and radio dramas where characters were expected to describe what they were seeing. In a theater play, elements of the story are imaginary. So a character might interact with an invisible cat by saying, oh look, it's a cat. And it's the same with radio dramas like War of the Worlds. Everything has to be described either by the actors or a narrator to help the audience follow along. But we no longer need that type of dialogue because film is a direct visual medium. And that means that dialogue can now be more subtle. <laughs> the actors can be more naturalistic, speaking in sentence fragments, or even not speaking. What they say can hint at their meaning or reveal character psychology. They don't need to state facts. They can even lie to each other and themselves. And with close-ups, a thought can be conveyed through a 
micro expression or a gesture. It doesn't need to be spoken clearly and loudly so everyone in the back of the theater can hear. But since writing the old way is the norm, it's a tough tradition to break. The more type one dialogue that writers experience on the screen, the more they will include it in their own writing. So in existence, the characters speak many descriptive facts at each other. And I was puzzled by that because the last two Cronenberg films I watched, Videodrome and Crimes of the Future, made decades apart, weren't in that type one dialogue style. I also listened to this film's full-length Cronenberg commentary track, and he did not mention that type one dialogue, so I suspect he wasn't doing it on purpose. For the specific examples of type one dialogue and acting I'm talking about, I recommend looking closely at three scenes. The Jeep scene, the tooth scene, and the motel room scene. And those are scenes two, three, and four at the beginning of the film. From then on, the story morphs into a deeper level of surrealism where the multiple levels of virtual reality collide and intertwine. And the film wraps up with a kind of Twilight Zone ending. It was all a game within a game within a game. But instead of letting the audience figure that out and just ending the film, Cronenberg draws it out and delivers a heavy dose of type one dialogue. But since David Cronenberg can do no wrong, and he should direct every film ever made, I gave this film five out of five stars on Letterboxd. Okay, that's the end of this episode of The Carl King Show. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else you consume these dang episodes. And if you like this show, support the creation of more by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King, or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for joining me. And as I always say, I need to kill our waiter. <laughs>